order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Afzal Khan. Mr. Speaker, social care services. Number one. Well done. The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that all members across the House will wish to join me in wishing all the Home Nations teams the very best of luck in the Rugby League World Cup, which is starting this week. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Afzal Khan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Social care services in England are in crisis. Since 2010, the local council in Manchester has had its annual social care budget cut by £32 million. By March, the government will have taken £6.3 billion out of social care. Why won't the Prime Minister match Labour's commitment to invest £8 billion in social care in next month's budget? As I have said uh, in this House before, we recognise the pressure that there is on social care as we see an ageing population. There is, and I've said this before, there are short-term, medium-term and long-term answers to this. In the short term, we have made extra funding available to local authorities. Uh, the late last announcement that was made in the budget by my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, was for an extra £2 billion for local authorities. In the medium time term, we need to make sure that best practice is being observed across all uh, local authorities and NHS trusts. In some cases, delayed discharges are far higher, are higher than they are in others. We need to make sure there's best practice. And in the long term, we need a sustainable footing for our social care system. And that's why we will be in in due course, uh, publishing a full and open consultation on ideas and proposals to ensure that we can have that sustainable social care system in the future. Kevin Foster. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware of the vital role supported housing plays with many vulnerable people in Torbay. What reassurances can she give me about the ongoing support the Government will be giving to those vital services? Yeah. My honourable friend does raise an important issue, and this is something that we've been looking at very closely over the past year. Uh, since, in fact, my right honourable friend, the first Secretary of State, commissioned work on this when he was Work and Pension Secretary in September last year, I can confirm that we will be publishing our response to that consultation on Tuesday, the 31st of October. It will look at a wide range of issues. We need to ensure the funding model is right so that all providers of supported housing actually are able to access funding effectively. We need to look at issues such as the significant increase in um, service charges that have taken place recently, making sure that we're looking at cost control in the sector. But I can also say today that as part of our response to the review, we will not apply the local housing allowance cap to supported housing. Indeed, Indeed, we will not be implementing it in the wider social rented sector, and the full details will be made available when we publish our response to the consultation. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I. It's all right, Tracy Almond's coming. Um, Mr Speaker, I join the Prime Minister in wishing the rugby league team all the very best in the competition. I hope they win it. Last week, Mr Speaker, the House voted by 299 to zero to pause the rollout of universal credit. Will the Prime Minister respect the will of the House? Uh, as I've said before, we acknowledge the fact that there are concerns people have raised with universal credit. That's why, as we've been rolling it out, we have been listening to those and changes have been made. But perhaps I could just update the House on where we are on the rollout of universal credit. Currently, currently of people claiming benefits, 8% are on universal credit. By January of next year, that will rise to 10%. The rollout is being conducted in three phases, and the intention is that it will be completed by 2022. So it's being done in a measured way. And I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that four out of five people are satisfied or very satisfied with the service that they are receiving. Universal credit helps people into the workplace and it makes sure that work pays, and that's what the welfare system should do. Jeremy Corbyn! I 
would have thought, Mr Speaker, that if only 8% of the rollout has taken place and 20% of the people in receipt of it are dissatisfied with it, that's a cause for thought, maybe a pause in the whole process. And last week, only one Conservative MP had the courage of their convictions to vote with us on uh, suspending universal credit rollout. For the life, and then, Mr. Speaker, a Conservative member of the Welsh Assembly, Angela Burns, said, and I quote, For the life of me, I cannot understand why a six or four week gap is deemed acceptable. She called universal credit callous at best and downright cruel at worst, and concluded by saying she's ashamed of her government. Can the Prime Minister ease her colleagues' shame? by pausing and fixing universal credit. As I have said to the right hon. Gentleman, we have been making changes to the implementation of UC as it has gone through the rollout. But let's, let's be very clear about why we introduced universal credit. It is because it is a system. It is a system. The members are getting rather overexcited. The question has been put and the answer will be heard. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we introduced universal credit as a simpler, more straightforward system that ensures that work pays and helps people into the workplace. Under Labour, let's look at what happened in the benefit system under Labour. Under Labour, the low paid paid tax and then had it paid back to them in benefits. Under Labour, people were trapped on a life and benefits. Under Labour, the number of workless households doubled, and Labour's benefit system, Labour's benefit system, cost households an extra £3,000 a year. What the Conservatives have done is given the low pay to pay rise, given the workers a tax cut, and ensure we've got a benefit system that helps people into work. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr. Speaker, under Labour one million children were lifted out of poverty. Under Labour, we introduced the principle of the national minimum wage, opposed by all Tories over there. And if the Prime Minister is not prepared to listen to Angela Burns, perhaps she could listen to the architect of universal credit, the Right Honourable Member for Chingford and Woodford Green, who said, one of the reasons I resigned from the Government was I didn't actually agree with the additional waiting days. This is something the Government needs to look at. Does the Prime Minister agree with him? is not just the uh, answer that I've uh, answer I've given I think three or four times now in this PMQs but in previous PMQs but as we look at universal credit rollout we do look at the the way in which we're introducing it but let's just he talked about what happened under labor and I'm happy to talk about what happened under labor well on a ah, far too much noise and finger pointing on both sides of the chamber, the responses from the Prime Minister will be heard, as will the questions from the Leader of the Opposition and every other member, without fear or favour. The Prime Minister. Under the Labour Party, the Right Honourable Gentleman is talking about rolling out of new benefit system. Well, let's think about what happened when the Labour Party rushed to introduce tax credits. I was not the only member of Parliament in this House who had people in my constituency surgery who had filled the forms improperly, who had given their information to the authorities, and then years later the Government came back and landed them with bills for thousands of pounds. That's what's happened when you rush into a system rather than introducing it properly as we are. Mr Speaker, I thought we passed the threshold last week when the Prime Minister was going to answer questions, but we obviously not, haven't achieved that yet. <laughs> Labour introduced working tax credits in order to help people on low pay out of poverty, and it made a very big difference. But, Mr Speaker, the sad truth is that universal credit is in such a mess 
that councils are forced to pick up the bill. I'll give you an example. Croydon Council, which piloted the scheme, is now spending £3 million of its own budget to prevent tenants from being evicted due to rent arrears caused by universal credit. Does the Prime Minister think it is right or fair the hard-pressed local authorities, having their budget cut by central government, having to dip into what little money they've got left in order to prevent people being evicted when they know full well it's the responsibility of this government and its system of universal credit that's causing the problem. Labour introduced working tax credits and then called thousands of pounds back from people who were working hard. He raises the issue of rent arrears, and I know that members have concerns over people who are managing their budgets to pay their rent. Uh, For the vast majority of people on universal credit, this is not an issue managing their budget. And indeed, after four months, after four months, the number of people uh, on universal credit who are in arrears has fallen by a third. But we recognise the issue, so we're working with landlords. We have built flexibility into the system so that actually landlords can be paid directly. And I want to be clear that nobody can be legally evicted from social housing due to short-term rent arrears. I think that is an important point for us to get across to, uh, to people. But I come back to the essential point about universal credit. This is about a welfare system that helps people into work, that makes work pay and that does not trap people in a life on benefits for years. I note the Prime Minister couldn't say anything about people being evicted from the private rented sector because of universal credit problems. Mr Speaker, the costs in the benefit system are being driven by low pay and high rents. In 2015, the then Chancellor, her former friend, promised a £9 an hour living wage. However, at the March budget, it was sneaked out that the Government's minimum wage would only reach £8.75. The welfare state was not created to subsidise low-paying employers and overcharging landlords. <clears throat> so will the, budget, will the budget in November put the onus back? Order! Order! Mr Hoare, I expect better of you. You were much better behaved when you were at Oxford University. What's happened to you, man? Calm yourself. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, my question is this. Will the budget in November put the onus back onto employers to pay a decent wage so that workers can make ends meet? We, uh, of course, we want to ensure that there are higher paid jobs in this country. That is precisely why we are investing in the economy for the future. It is precisely why we are investing in our infrastructure, investing in schools for uh, young people, and it is why we are introducing a modern industrial strategy. But the right honourable gentleman says that he didn't want that the welfare system wasn't created to subsidise employers who are playing low wages. That is exactly what Labour's working tax credit system did. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the government's own the government's own Social Mobility Commission reported that low pay was endemic in the United Kingdom. One in four workers permanently stuck in low-paid jobs. That is why Labour backs a real living wage of £10 per hour to make work pay. Mr Speaker, this government does not really know whether it is coming or going. They say... (laughs) Mr Speaker... The Conservative Party and the Government says they have full confidence in universal credit, but won't vote for it. <laughs> they say they will end the NHS pay cut, but won't allocate any money to pay for it. The Community Secretary backs £50 billion of borrowing on housing, but the Chancellor says it's not policy. The Brexit Secretary says they're planning for a no-deal Brexit. The Chancellor says they're not. Isn't the case, Mr Speaker, this government is weak, incompetent, divided and unable, unable to take a decision? Order, 
Uh, order! Order! I said that the responses from the Prime Minister would be heard. And the remarks <laughs> of the right honourable gentleman will be heard. You can try to shout him down, and other members can try to shout the Prime Minister down. It won't work. End of. Jeremy Corbyn. Isn't it the case that this government is weak, incompetent and divided and unable to take the essential decisions necessary for the good of the people of this country? Now, I will tell the right honourable gentleman, of course we want to see people earning higher wages. Of course we want, as we are doing, to be able to ensure we can invest in our public services. But the way to do that, the way to have a higher standard of living, to have higher wages, to invest in our public services, to have a better future for uh, for people in this country, is to build and continue to build that stronger economy. And you don't build a stronger economy by losing control of public finances. You don't build a stronger economy by uncontrolled borrowing. You don't build a stronger economy by hitting people with the highest taxes in our peacetime history. You don't build a stronger economy by voting against progress in our Brexit negotiations. And you don't and you don't you don't build you don't build a stronger economy by planning for capital flight and a run on the pound. That's what Labour would do and we will never let it happen. Some people in Plymouth are campaigning by way of a petition to say that lifeboats must be launched immediately. A fishing vessel is overdue. I believe this is irresponsible and puts our valiant lifeboat crews in peril if they don't know where they're going. We know this in Cornwall. Would the Prime Minister look at making safety grants available so that all fishing boats can have an AIS locator beacon on board? This would cost well under £4 million, even if every registered fishing vessel under 15 metres got a full grant for covering the whole cost. My late husband had one of these aboard his boat. Can I, can I uh, thank my honourable friend for raising this issue? And as she has just said, I know this is an area where she tragically has personal experience, and I'd like to commend her for the work that she's done uh, in this important area and for championing these causes. I think she is right. Launching a lifeboat whenever a fishing vessel is overdue may be the wrong decision. It could, as she says, be dangerous for the crew involved. That's why the Coast Guard do take uh, time to gather valuable information uh, before deciding how best to respond. On the issue that she's raised, actually there are a number of grants available from various safety schemes, and I'd encourage all those involved in fishing to make the most of those grants that are available. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that migration is key to delivering sustainable economic growth? What I think is absolutely key is to ensure that we have controlled migration in this country. That's what the people of this country want and that's what this government is delivering. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, an American couple... (laughs) The Felbers moved to Scotland and invested £400,000 to run an award-winning guest house in Inverness. They contribute to their community and the local economy, yet they will be deported because of a retrospective change by Home Office rules. Will the Prime Minister meet with me and their MP from Inverness to discuss this case and the systemic problems with UK migration? There aren't systemic problems with UK migration. My right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, is happy to meet with the uh, honourable gentleman in order to discuss the specific case he has raised. What I think is absolutely right is that Home Office does work to ensure that the immigration rules are being properly applied and that action is being taken according to those rules. Now it is time to hear Mr Simon Hall. I have composed myself. (laughs) I was uh, greatly cheered last week to hear, as I'm sure many colleagues were in the House, the German Chancellor say uh, that a final deal with regards to Brexit is going to happen. Does my right honourable friend agree with my assessment that we are going to get a good deal that works for our country, for the European Union, and possibly more importantly, for my constituents of North Dorset? 
Well, can I? Uh, I, abs- I do agree with my honourable friend. I believe that we are. Our job is to get the best Brexit deal for Britain. I believe that we can get that best Brexit deal for Britain. I believe that's a deal that will benefit the United Kingdom, that will benefit the United Kingdom across all parts of the UK, including his constituents in North Dorset that we maximise the benefits from leaving the EU while ensuring that we maintain the greatest possible access uh, to EU markets. That's what we're continuing to work on. That's what vision that I set out in my Florence speech and the European Union, as we know, are now preparing their response to that. Joe Platt. The Prime Minister has previously stated her commitment to apprenticeships. However, in my constituency, the apprenticeship levy has not been helping those for whom it was designed. What steps will she take to ensure that apprenticeships help those from lower income backgrounds? Apprenticeships are important. We have already, in the government from 2010 to 2015, we saw two million more apprenticeships uh, being uh, uh, created. We are committed to another further 1.9 million apprenticeships being created. This is important. I think the important point about apprenticeships is that this is an opportunity for young people not to feel that they just have to be uh, encouraged to go down an academic route when that does not work for them. What is important when I meet apprentices is that they say this is, for many of them, the best thing that they have done, and we want to make sure it's available for all those who will benefit from it. Victoria Prentice. Mr Speaker, Charwell tops the leaderboard for new housing. Can the Prime Minister, can the Prime Minister assure me that the right roads, school places, post boxes and, of course, especially health care provision will be in place to support both my new constituents and the ones I've got at the moment? Well, my, uh, can I first of all uh, congratulate uh, my honourable friend and say that I'm very pleased that Charwell District is doing what we want to do, what we recognise we need to do to build, uh, to tackle our dysfunctional housing market, which is to build more homes. But she's right; infrastructure is also an important part of that. Uh, that's why we've committed to £15 billion for our road investment strategy. Over half a trillion pounds will be spent on the NHS in England during this Parliament, and a record £41 billion will be spent in core funding for schools this year. And that, I'm pleased to say, is the record of Conservatives in Government. Stuart Hosey. In 24 hours, the people of Dundee will wave off the bid for the 2023 European Capital of Culture. Uh, a fantastic bid which will generate some 1,500 jobs and add 5 per cent to local GDP. So can I ask the Prime Minister, notwithstanding her current difficulties with Europe, to back this bid, given it comes from the most innovative and forward-looking city in the whole of the UK? Can I say to the the Honourable Gentleman that, uh, of course, we are always willing to back bids from any city in the United Kingdom to to become the European City of of Culture. Uh, But I welcome the fact that Dundee has put a a bid forward and is uh, is part of this. But as I say, we want to support all cities in the United Kingdom who are doing it. Richard Graham. Mr Speaker, it is a criminal offence for those like teachers in a position of trust to have a sexual relationship with those young people under 18. But a constituent came to me recently distressed about exactly such a relationship between his 17-year-old daughter and a middle-aged driving instructor. Now, while if consensual this is not illegal, I am concerned that there might be risks to young drivers of being groomed by a predatory instructor. Mm. Mm. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that driving instructors are, by the nature of their work, in a position of trust, should be covered by the same rules as teachers, and if so, would she ask the relevant minister to work with me on this? Mm. Well, um, I, I'm concerned to hear the case that, of his constituent that my honourable friend has raised. <coughs> Uh, and I recognise the position and the, the role that driving instructors play. Can I say to my honourable friend, I think this is something that I will ask uh, the appropriate department to look at and to get in touch with him to get further details of his case. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in March 2019, the Prime Minister told this House that Parliament would be given a meaningful vote on the terms of the Article 50 Withdrawal Bill. This morning, in the Brexit Select Committee, the Secretary of State told us that that vote may not take place until after March 2019. 
Can the Prime Minister please explain how it's possible to have a meaningful vote on something that's already taken place? As the Honourable Gentleman knows, we are in negotiations with the European Union, but I am confident that we will. The timetable under the Lisbon Treaty does give time until March 2019 for the negotiations to take place, but I am confident, because it is in the interests of both sides, and it is not just this Parliament that wants to have a vote on that deal, but actually there will be ratification by other parliaments, that we will be able to achieve that agreement and that negotiation in time for this Parliament to have the vote that we committed to. Robert Jenry. We enter a week of commemorations around the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. Uh, would my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, rededicate us to the pursuit of peace and justice for both the Israelis and the Palestinians, but celebrate with pride our small national contribution to the creation of a democracy in the Middle East, yeah. a sanctuary for those who have suffered from anti-Semitism and fear its rise again, and in the State of Israel, a true friend of the United Kingdom. Well, can I first of all say to my honourable friend that we are proud of the role that we played in the creation of the State of Israel, and we will certainly mark the centenary with pride. And uh, I'm also uh, pleased at the good trade relations and other relationships that we have with Israel, and that we have, are building on and enhancing. We also must be conscious of the sensitivities that some people do have about the Balfour Declaration, and we recognise that there is more work to be done. We remain uh, committed to the two-state solution in relation to Israel and uh, the uh, Palestinians. That is an important uh, uh, aim. I think it is important that we all recommit to ensuring that we can provide security, stability and justice for both Israelis and Palestinians through such a lasting peace. Tonya Antoniazzi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Trying to get a decision on the Swansea Bay Tide Lagoon is becoming like Groundhog Day. Swansea is ready, the investors are ready. Can I ask the Prime Minister when she will be ready? Uh, I say the Honourable Lady, as she well knows, this raises a number of complex issues. We were grateful to Charles Hendry for the review that he, uh, that he conducted, and the relevant department is still, uh, the business department, is considering this, and we will respond in due course. Anne Marie Trevelyan. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does the Prime Minister agree that as we leave the EU and take control of our land management policy, our manifesto commitment to plant 11 million trees is a critical part of a holistic countryside management framework, which we can now build to ensure long term homegrown wood for our housing industry, alongside increasing our natural carbon capture potential and reducing flood risks? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. We did commit in our manifesto to plant. 11 million trees. We are putting that at the heart of our work to protect the environment for future generations. I am pleased to say that since April 2015 we have planted just over 2 million trees, but we do have much more to do, and we will be continuing to work with landowners and stakeholders uh, on this particular issue. But she is absolutely right. It is not just about the look of the countryside. It is also about the, the, the uh, role that trees play in reducing flood risks and, as she also says, in helping to hold carbon dioxide. The Prime Minister has uh, spoken on mental health, and can I thank her for that. Uh, When she was Home Secretary, she outlawed uh, police cells being used for those in mental health crisis. Today, though, parts of our mental health system are in crisis. In my North Durham constituency, children, young people and families uh, are waiting two years for autism assessments. The Secretary of State agrees that that is unacceptable. Can I ask the Prime Minister what she's going to do to turn her uh, a well-intentioned statements on mental health into action? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, as he will know, we are uh, doing, taking a number of courses of action in relation to mental health, but he's raised the specific issue of the autism diagnosis and the length of time that it takes in his constituency. And I know that my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, has promised to look into this and will be doing so, because we're very clear that we want to ensure that adults and children shouldn't have to face too long a period of waiting for an autism uh, diagnosis to take place. The Department of Health is working with partners uh, to help local areas address these issues where there are long term long waiting times for an autism diagnosis and they are go pub, uh, nice have published clinical guidance which sets out that assessment should begin within three months of referral. Obviously it's for the Department of Health to be working with those local areas to make sure that it is possible to achieve that. 
Steve Double. Tomorrow at Cornwall Newquay Airport, the Bloodhound will carry out its first live test run in the next step on its quest to achieve the land speed record. Would the Prime Minister join me in uh, wishing the whole Bloodhound team, and especially the driver Andy Green, a successful test run? And does she agree with me that projects like this show that the UK continues to lead the world in its innovation in science and engineering? I say to my honourable friend, I am very happy to join him in wishing uh, the Bloodhound team well. Indeed, I have met some of the members of the team in the past, but I also agree with the other point that he makes, that this continues to show what a world leader in science and innovation the United Kingdom is. We have some of the world's best universities. Four of our universities are in the world's top ten, and we have more Nobel Prize winners than any country outside of the United States. This is a record of which our country can be proud, and I am sure we will all be proud of the Bloodhound team and its achievements. Thelma Walker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that, as a result of the potential downgrading of Huddersfield Royal Infirmary, 479 professionals lost, over 300 hospital beds cut, and a 90 minute journey to the nearest AE are not in the best interests of my constituents? And will she meet with me to discuss the detrimental impact this will have on Combe Valley and the surrounding area? Uh, the principle that we want to uh, base all these decisions on is that service changes should be based on clear evidence and they should be led by local clinicians who best understand what the local healthcare needs are. I understand that Calderdale and Kirklees councils have referred the proposed changes to my right honourable friend, the Health Secretary, uh, and I know he'll be considering those issues very carefully and will be coming to a decision in due course. Nikki Morgan. Next year sees the centenary of the first woman member of parliament. Will my right honourable friend uh, tell us what leadership and encouragement to the women and girls in his constituency to take part in public life? The member for Sheffield Hallam has shown in his remarks. Can I, can I say to Can I say to my right honourable friend? that I think it is important that we mark this centenary next year and recognise the role that women have played in this House and in their time in uh, public life. I want to see young women and uh, uh, women actually able to see this House as a place that they actively want to come to, that they want to contribute to their society, that they want to respond to the needs of, of local constituents and make a real difference to people's lives. That's what I'm in it for. That's why I've encouraged more women to come into this House. And I'm pleased to say that we have more women on our benches than ever before. And finally, all of us, all of us, all of us in this house all of us in this house should have due care and attention to the way in which we refer to other people and should show women in public life the respect that they deserve Tommy Shepherd Thank you Mr Speaker and um, yesterday the Scottish Parliament voted by 91 votes to 28 to ban fracking in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask the Prime Minister why she wouldn't consider following Scotland's lead and introducing, and introducing a moratorium in the rest of the United Kingdom in order that there can be a full evaluation of the health and environmental consequences of this controversial technology and in order that the public can be consulted? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that this is an issue on which he and I are simply going to disagree, because I think that shale gas does have the potential uh, to power economic growth in this country. I think it will support thousands of jobs in the oil and gas industries and in other sectors, and it will provide a new domestic energy source. And we have more than 50 years of drilling experience in the UK and one of the best records in the world for economic development while protecting our environment. Uh, so I, uh, the Shell Wealth Fund is going to provide up to £1 billion of additional resources to local communities. Local councils are going to be able to retain 100% of the business rates they collect from Shell Gas Developments. We will build, uh, be bringing forward further proposals in relation to this during this Parliament, but this is an important potential new source of energy, and I think it's right that we ensure that we uh, 
use this and take the benefits of it for our economy, for jobs and for people's futures. Craig Tracy. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure the Prime Minister is aware of the terrifying incident on Sunday where a gunman held hostages at a bowling alley in my neighbouring constituency of Nuneaton, a facility enjoyed by my own constituents in North Warwickshire and Bedworth. Will she join me and the Honourable Member for Nuneaton in praising the excellent work of Warwickshire Police and West Midlands Ambulance Services in ensuring that the situation was brought to a swift conclusion without any casualties? I say to my honourable friend that of course we were all concerned to hear of this incident as it was taking place and I'm happy to join him and the uh, honourable member for Nuneaton in commending the professionalism and bravery as he says of the Warwickshire police uh, in bringing this to a swift conclusion also of the ambulance service in ensuring that there were no injuries. Our emergency services do do an amazing job in protecting us. This is exactly the sort of incident uh, which they don't know when they put on their uniforms in the morning, whether this is the sort of thing they'll have to be called to. Uh, but I was pleased to welcome a number of our emergency services personnel to a reception in Downing Street on Monday. And what uh, they all say, and they always say, is they were just doing their job. But my goodness me, what a job they do for us. Alison McGovern. Mr Speaker, on the 29th of March, I asked the Prime Minister if she would help the people of New Ferry after the huge explosion that devastated the town centre. She said she was happy to help and there will be support offered to the community in the future. <coughs> Two weeks later, Mr Speaker, she called a general election and her government seems to have all but forgotten about the people yeah. in New Ferry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she may have forgotten, Mr Speaker, but my constituents haven't. So I ask her again, precisely when will her government put their hands in their pockets so that the people in New Ferry can rebuild their town and their lives? Yeah. I say to the Honourable Lady that the government has not forgotten about this issue. I understand from the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government that we are waiting for the Local Council to produce uh, proposals and to produce a business case for those proposals and will, of course, look at those seriously. John Howell. In acknowledging the hard work of the men and women at RAF Benson in my constituency for the work that they did in the Caribbean, Will she also acknowledge that the Puma 2 helicopter was ready and available for work in the Caribbean within a couple of hours of having arrived? Yes. Well, I'm very happy to uh, commend the work of all those at RAF Benson and indeed all those in our military who, and volunteers who were able to provide support after the devastating hurricanes that uh, took place in the Caribbean. And uh, I'm also happy to agree with my honourable friend that contrary to some of the stories that were being put about, actually we were there, we were there on time and we were able to act very quickly in giving people that support. Joanna Cherry. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, we can all agree that no one should ever be persecuted on account of their sexuality. Last week at the Pink News Awards, the Prime Minister said that we have come a long way on LGBT plus rights, but there's still much more to do. Can I ask her to start that remaining work today by promising that never again will the Home Office deport LGBT asylum seekers to countries where they are, where they are likely to be persecuted? Yeah, 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 with the instruction that they pretend to be straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I say to the Honourable Lady that this is an issue that we take seriously, and think I, indeed I think I'm right in saying that it was Conservative government that actually changed the rules on uh, asylum seeking to introduce the uh, category of those who w could face persecution in their home of origin because of their sexuality. I'm pleased that that was able to be done, and uh, I'm sure that the Home Office treats all these cases, and I want them to treat all these cases with the sensitivity that is appropriate. Luke Graham. Speaker. As of 2016, Mr Speaker, 17 per cent of the premises in Scotland were without superfast broadband. This is compared with just 8, 11 per cent for the UK as a whole. Would my right honourable friend join me in calling on the Scottish Government to do more yeah. and to constructively yeah. engage with and constructively engage with departments here in Westminster to deliver this crucial service to communities in Scotland? Well, can, I, can, I, can I say to can I say order, order, order. all sorts of very curious hand and finger gestures are being 
deployed, each trying to do the other in terms of eccentricity and possibly of prowess. But I'm interested in hearing the Prime Minister's reply. The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, can I say to my honourable friend that I think we all recognise the importance of broadband and fast broadband being available to people in our constituencies. Um, But he's absolutely right. The members of the Scottish Nationalist Party come down here to Westminster. They spend spend a lot of time they spend a lot of time talking about powers for the Scottish Government. Actually it's time the Scottish Government got on with using its powers for the benefit of the people in Scotland. Mr Speaker, in the past fortnight we have heard the announcement of the loss of many hundreds of jobs in Lancashire at BAE system sites at Walton and Salmsbury, which has come as a hammer blow to workers and their families. Today I wish to raise the proposed closure of the Alstom factory on Strand Road in Preston, which will mean the loss of another 180 jobs. We keep hearing the hype about the so-called Northern Powerhouse, so why are aerospace and train manufacturers in the North shedding jobs by hundreds? Uh, the Honourable Gentleman, I recognise that this is a worrying time for the workers involved, and uh, obviously we will ensure through the Department of Work and Pensions that they have the support they need to look for new jobs, and that does include the Rapid Response Service, which obviously, obviously gives very particular support to people in these, uh, in these areas. But in relation to the decision, for example, by BAE Systems, I mean, I can assure the House that we will continue to promote our world-leading defence industry. I hope all Labour members will continue to promote our world-leading defence industry. I am very pleased that just last month my right honourable friend, the Defence Secretary, signed a statement of intent with Qatar committing them to the purchase of 24 typhoons and six hawks from BAE. And last year, the Ministry of Defence spent £3.7 billion with BAE, and they're working with them to maximise export opportunities for typhoons and hawks in the future to ensure that we can retain jobs here in the United Kingdom. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When it comes to tackling homelessness, prevention is better than cure. So I'm delighted that the Government has backed my Homelessness Reduction Act. But one of the obstacles that people that choose to rent face is putting together the deposit and helping with the rent. Will my right hon. Friend look at a scheme that would provide 32,000 people a year the opportunity to rent for an investment of £3.1 million a year? But not only that, Mr Speaker, it would save the public purse up to £1.8 billion over a three-year period. Well, I thank uh, my honourable friend for the issue he has long campaigned on, this issue of, of the issue of homelessness and preventing homelessness, and I'm pleased that we were able to support his Homelessness Reduction Act, and I think that would be an important contribution in this particular area. Uh, I understand in, on the specific issue that he has raised, he has made a representation, a pre-budget representation, to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who I'm sure will be looking at that, uh, ve- uh, that representation very carefully on the more general issue of helping people to buy and helping them with deposits. Of course, I'm pleased that we have been able to announce an extra £10 billion into our Help to Buy scheme, which does make a real difference to people to enable them to get into homes. Finally, Mr Nigel Dodds. Speaker. The the workforce, the unions and the management at Bombardier and Belfast deserve enormous credit for the way in which they have responded to the threats Uh, coming from the United States and Boeing in particular, uh, which is a threat to their jobs and livelihoods. Uh, Can the Prime Minister give us an assurance that she will continue building on the good work that has already happened through herself and the Secretary of State for Business and also the Northern Ireland Secretary, that she will continue to work with us, the unions and management, to ensure the threat of tariffs is removed, that the C-Series is a success story and that thousands of jobs in Belfast uh, are protected and across the United Kingdom uh, as well. Yeah. well I'm, I'm very happy to give that commitment. We will certainly, a lot of work has been done uh, in relation to this issue by myself, by the Business Secretary, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and other ministers uh, in, uh, with their opposite numbers in America and in, uh, in Canada. And we will certainly continue to do that work. Obviously, the most recent announcement that has been made in relation to uh, Airbus and uh, the SEER series is an important uh, announcement. But we want to ensure that those jobs stay in Northern Ireland because we recognise the importance of those jobs for the economy of Northern Ireland, but also obviously for the people and their families. Order. 